want to take a moment to, to thank our, some of our sponsors up here. If you don't, if you haven't already, uh, step outside after this presentation and check out the video we have out there. Uh, but, but thank you to Sands Institute, to Cerner, Sumo Logic, Cerner, uh, Red Canary. Thank you all very much. We couldn't do it without you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over. Uh, this is Hudson Bush. He's been a, if, if any of you all have ever tried to put together a, a comprehensive security roadmap. Um, getting started is very difficult, but we thought what a better way to start the first track of, of track two than uh, kind of a big picture of, of a security roadmap. And with that, I will turn over to Hudson. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, normally I start off saying you don't need to take pictures of my slides because they will be online, but in this case I got locked out of GitHub because I changed my phone and I do not have, um, yeah, I haven't figured out the uh, MFA yet. So, um, take pictures if you'd like. I have an old version of this on um, my website that I'll plug at the end. Um, if you need me to send you slides, re reach out on Twitter. Um, so, big picture, building a security program from the ground up. Um, I have not given this talk since pre-plague. A lot of things have changed in two years. My role has changed a lot in two years. Um, I've tried to revise a lot of things, but if what I talk about does not match the slides, it's because I thought of something on the fly. Um, background here is that um, I have worked for a lot of small companies. I've done consulting pretty much my entire career up until about two years ago. So I just did not see anyone talking about the basics and even more than the basics, talking about like how you roll that out or just even the big picture, which is where I've changed this to a little more. This I used to call this talk um, starting from scratch, building a security program from the ground up in 365 days. Um, title now sounds a little more applicable to some people because you may not actually be building from scratch. But even if you're not a CISO or a security manager or the only security staff, this talk should be able to give you a good foundation of the many avenues in security. Um, also, this could probably be an eight-hour um, training, so in, so I will talk fast. Um, so let me get to audience participation. I will not be having a Q&A. Two reasons. One, uh, a lot of us men are dicks, and we use Q&A as a chance to tell women speakers that how, how you would have given the talk. So I like to lead the way and say, hey, men are being abusive. You do not need to do a Q&A, because, yeah, don't, don't do that. But then two, um, I have a lot to cover, and I will not have time to do So uh, if you have questions, find me after, tweet me, find my email, OSINT, you know. Hey, if you have questions in the middle, you can yell. Um, if I mumble or talk too fast, which I will, I promise, yell, yell at me, I, I won't get offended. Um, same with if I use an acronym or concept you don't understand, I'm going through things quickly. I try to elaborate, but I mean not. Talk about goals a little bit, but um, big, I, I, I had a huge GRC background, but I also did a lot of technical. So um, a lot of us are nerds that like to think from the technical first and not think of the big picture and how everything fits in. So um, I'm going to try and move the needle a little bit and say, hey, let's think about how these things fit in and not just cool, I'm in shiny product. Um, if, if you're not someone who has to do what I'm talking about directly, you know, all, touch all the things, it still gives you a starting place. If you're new to the industry, this should give you a research point for a lot of things. I may talk about something you've never heard of um, because you may not have ever had to do policies or whatever I end up talking about. Um, if you are doing this, hopefully I've done some of the research for you, um, give you resources to bring to your management so you don't have to make this stuff up. And the biggest thing that I like to do, and we also do, is talk about our mistakes so that uh, other people don't need to repeat them. I've already made these mistakes. You should make original new mistakes. So, um, phases, this, oh, that's really small. Um, usually it's a much bigger screen. But um, if you want to take a picture, these are just how I carve things up, but also nothing is linear. You may walk into an organization and need to do phase four or three or two in whatever order, but um, there is a reason I've structured it this way, because I have to structure it some way, but also things are not going to be done in parallel. Um, 
uh, things are going to be done in parallel uh, a linear process. So I like to kind of, if, if you're building this in a year, which not everyone's going to, but if you are actually trying to implement this in a year, I like to carve it into quarters. Start with quarter one, phase one, um, planning and discovery. You've got to understand what you have before you just buy things. Um, analysis and documentation, you know, going to do some of that in parallel, but again, um, document what you just learned in the previous quarter, um, and then actually do some things in phase three, and then phase four, looking forward, planning for the future. The idea is that once you start in phase one, you're probably going to do it the whole way down. You're not just going to like, okay, I only spent three months mitigating, now I'm done. Three months documenting, I'm done. No, not going to that So, phase one, planning and discovery. Um, there's a reason that um, asset management is you know, the beginning and one of the core things of um, CIS, it's you can't secure what you don't know. So uh, we'd like to, we like to come in and think, hey, you know, I we really need this new firewall, or I can talk to a vendor at a con and I need this product. Um, at some point, I used to, almost every slide, have a little red balloon pop up and say, do I buy things yet? People didn't think it was as funny as I did. People thought it was annoying, so I got rid of that. But you can imagine in your head, every, and the answer will always be no. Like pretty much to the very end, you could probably get a, go a year without buying things unless you really have, are starting from a horrible place. Um, so a bit of background about me that I did not talk about. I didn't introduce my employer, so if anyone there is watching, I am doing that now. I work at TT Electronics, a British manufacturing company you've never heard of, but we make a lot of small things and end up in a bunch of things. So the, and then we actually we own a company called Toratel that's over in Olathe. You might have heard of them. So. Um, a lot of this is very manufacturing focused. I'm going to try to talk into some of you that might have to deal with AppSec, deal with other things, but um, there's a very good bias towards Windows and those things, but I try and make things universal where possible. So, um, very first stage of discovery, um, you need to build a framework. This isn't just like, I'm going to make a bunch of things up and do industry best practice, industry best practice does not exist. Everyone has a different idea, there's not one set of it. Work from a framework, a vendor agnostic framework. Don't just say, oh, I'm going to use Microsoft security architecture because at some point you're going to buy something not Microsoft that's not going to fit in there. So um, I'm, I will talk in about three slides about why I think ISO is really cool and also some reasons you maybe don't want to use it. Um, NIST CSF, CIS controls, but also um, if you're doing compliance, that's your framework. If the reason you, I'm going to talk about it in three slides, but I'm going to intro for a second because you need to understand why the company cares about security. Um, you know why you care about security, and a lot of times we don't stop and think, okay, this company, I mean, maybe they just got breached. Maybe it's a small company and the owner saw a bunch of stuff about ransomware and doesn't want to lose his nest egg. Um, more than likely, it's, it's either breach or the government told them to, it's regulation. So, um, uh, I have been brought in most places because of compliance, you see that a lot here, so if you're having to do CMMC, you need to take 171, PCI even, that's less of a framework, but start from there, don't just say, cool, I'm also gonna implement ISO, do what the business wants you to do. If it's, you know, protect us from ransomware, then maybe don't even start with a framework, maybe just go to um, CISA, and download their ransomware playbook and go through what they tell you to do, and that's your framework for year one, um, if all you care about is ransomware protection. Um, but these are just three examples. Um, again, ISO is, is money, you know, money to buy the standard and then money to get certified, but I will talk in a few slides about that. Uh, resource assessment, understand, do you have any technical resources? Are you outsourcing? Um, What's your budget? What infrastructure do you already have? Are there some old servers in a closet that you could repurpose as a seam? I'll talk a lot about that because I like to build Frankenstein closet seams with no staff and no dedicated hardware. I think it's fun, um, but I'm a masochist. So you may not want to do that, but I'll explain to you how you could. Um, then in discovery, you want to asset discovery. You want to understand your software and hardware. You need to understand what you have. Um, then user education, um, has there been anything, and honestly, it's probably the first thing I'd implement is some sort of phishing simulation that I don't really like, but maybe I would much more prefer, a, I'll talk about why I don't like phishing simulation and all that, but um, 
I, I, I really like the idea of using a survey or a quiz to stuff their stay safe online. Uh, that may be a little basic, but understand where your users are, what they think. Um, maybe even do a survey to say, what do you think about IT and security? Um, do that at the beginning, understand it really helps with metrics and all of that. Um, and then, you know, use results of any survey for targeted user training. You don't have time to train your entire user base probably at first when you're doing a bunch of other nonsense. So, um, yeah. So figure out who needs to be trained first. Um, why it's that way. So, okay, policies and architecture, once you've kind of understood what you have, um, this may be later once you've done enough time for analysis, but this is something that too many people do and involve, everyone hates policies for one big reason. Um, someone comes in and goes, ooh, cool, I'm gonna write like military grade or whatever, you know, banking. If you're, if you're military or banking, sure, do those things. Military grade doesn't exist, um, but whatever. We can talk about that later. Um, but do not write policies for, with this ideal, this is the perfect security. Look and see what you are currently doing in the organization, and then add 10, 25%, whatever you can, slowly move the needle. Because if you start with this ideal thing, then no one's gonna follow it because it's 180 or a completely different you know, lane even than what you're doing, and no one can follow it. So don't write impossible policies. Um, also, I've talked about this a lot, this is one of the big theses of my talk, is don't start from tools and work instructions and individual processes up. Try whenever possible, unless there's one process that's just broken, you have to do that first. But don't start from the bottom, which is you know the actual implementation. Try and start from the top at policies and architectures. Um, understand what you're doing and why you're doing it before you talk about the who, when, and how. Um, so, um, I will, the next slide, I'm just gonna really briefly just explain a little more what policy, procedure, standard, and all that is. Um, I could do a whole, probably four hour training on architectures and GRC, not gonna do that. I'm gonna spend like 30 seconds on that slide, but the high level policies are, what are we doing? Architectures are, why are we doing it? How do they interconnect? Um, what's the strategy and the vision? The actual term is views and viewpoints um, and mission, but it's really the why and the strategy. It's not, hey, we click this button on our security mail gateway on our spam filter. It's more, how does this spam filter fit in with our bigger picture and what do we want it to do? And then the policies are, if you have an exception, how you manage that, not just Someone says, I can't get email from Raytheon. Okay, whitelist all emails from Raytheon, don't do that. Write your policies and procedures to understand that and start from the beginning. Um, and then I'll let, so policies are what? Go down to architectures, which are why. Procedures are your how. These are work instructions, these are, they can, you know, where we are currently, we have policy, procedure, then work instruction, um, and they find each other down there, but most people, a procedure is also a work instruction. Now, most people will write a project plan that it has Gantt and has all of those um, who. That's not what I mean by resource plan here. I mean, do we have any resources? Are we borrowing from IT? Are we using shadow IT for these things? Because you may be the only security person. Um, so resource plan is, these are the 12 security domains, uh, not .com domains, but you know, lanes, you know, access control, IAM, all those different things. These are who is responsible for these things? How are you resourcing it? What is your budget? And then next is roadmap. We want to do roadmap first, but we can't until we understand what, why, how, and who, when we do the when, and even the, the individual, the specific ones. This what is, you know, how, that we need to protect about against ransomware. There's a specific what down here, which is technical controls. Now, roadmap comes later probably three, six, nine months in, not immediately. So, this is, like I said, I'm gonna talk about this for seconds, but um, I have a link to it. This is um, Compliance Forge. Um, it's their, um, I think they call it their governance framework. Google it, um, but if you're having to write policies, I mean, if you are not a technical writer, have someone else do this, don't, learn a new skill, find someone illegal or hire an intern, something like that that can do this, but it's really key, you know, your policies, your objectives, your standards, your guidelines, and this is really good because 
we want to start with like secure baseline configs, but we need to know standards before we do that. But secure baseline configs are great, I mean, and do that before you even say exactly how you're going to implement it through Intune or GPO or Puppet or whichever, however you're implementing it for your environment. Make sure you flow down, top down, or from here, left, right. Um, but this is great if you have to do GRC and you know nothing about GRC. I would find GRC gov um, governance, uh, regulations, and compliance. It's essentially, the whole policy side of things, and more, it's governance. Okay. So, again, good resource. Cannot dive into that. So, cool. don't know why there's separated like that. Threat modeling. This is key. Um, threat model at every single stage. Don't just buy this tool because it's a cool, shiny thing. Um, you need to know what you're protecting and what you're protecting against. You need to know what the biggest threats in your industry are. There are ways to do that. US CERT, things like that is one of the easy ways to look at in, you know, reported breaches in your industry and see what kind of attacks are out there against you. Even some of it you can tell, you know, is it going to be opportunistic or is it going to be APT? Um, chances are most companies, unless you're at a big, you know, fortune company, you're, you're dealing with opportunistic attacks. Um, people don't know. If people don't know who you are without you explaining it in a paragraph like I had to explain, then chances are you're not dealing with APTs. So, um, threat modeling um, is you know, it's kind of risk assessment and business impact assessment is getting into more of the GRC side of it. Estimate what happens to the business if X happens and what the likeliness of X happening is. Chances are you can't really get into those numbers because that costs, I mean, big firms have huge teams that are just doing risk and they're, you know. So um, this is where I like to get into. We've always heard the defender's dilemma that an attacker only needs to exploit one weakness in a defender needs to protect against all weaknesses. Um, it's almost this picture of like a boat that's leaking and like you feeling like you need to close every single hole. No, it, 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 I, I really like to flip that on its head. It's not this defeatist attitude. The reality is um, a defender needs to make it too expensive for an attacker to exploit a target given the value of that target. You may not know the exact dollar amount, but no attacker is going to spend hours and hours and hours if you've closed a few holes. So figure out what the most likely you know, way in is and protect those first. Don't do the cool thing. Don't. This whole slide will pretty much be boiled down to don't spend an entire year protecting against like Spectre and Meltdown when you have like you you have remote desktop you know port 3389 open to the internet. Do the thing that the attacker is actually going to get in on. They're never going to worry you know popping in with a Spectre Meltdown zero day if they can get in much easier. So figure out how they're going to do it and what they're going to try and get to before you waste time on the cool shiny thing. But, and a lot of this comes down to do not build a security program like it's a blog post or a talk where you need to be all cool and sexy. This is not a sexy talk. Um, and the first year of these things is not sexy, it's not cool. It, now everyone leaves because I just said, hey, this is a boring talk. Listen to the rest of it, please. Um, but it's, I mean, do the basics. I don't even like calling them that because they're not basic, but do the fundamentals first. Do the uh, do do the, the things that are actually going to breach you. So, topic management. Um, should probably do this the whole way around, but I I can only put so many slides in here. So, and I can only put it in a certain order. So, should probably do this day one, but then also kind of at the end of the quarter, I like to. You, you got to be checking in with management. From day one, you should probably understand business objectives. Um, what, what are they trying to protect? I talked about it a little more in compliance and all that, but do we care about intellectual property? Are you making cots, you know, like commercial off-the-shelf products that you can find a spec by Googling? Like, maybe you don't care about intellectual property. Maybe you only care about compliance. Maybe you only care about ransomware. Maybe you care about export control needs. Figure out what the business cares about. Um, if it's a small business, really, usually it's, I'm gonna protect my nest egg, and there's some old owner that doesn't you know, that, that doesn't want the company to die before he does. So, understand why you're doing it and model to that. Um, understand what security policies, procedures, and standards are there, uh, because chances are there's something, chances are bad, and you need to rewrite it. Um, when you're talking about management, I like to increase buy-in. This, um, 
uh, Jake Mauerdick, uh, Jake Williams just gave a really good talk on this. I do not think it was recorded, but I think he published slides on, um, it don't, I think he called it something like, don't talk nerdy to me, um, and it's, you know, explaining blue team to the two executives. Um, but he, you know, there's been a big talk over the last five years about don't make security just a cost center, try and make a profit center. He pretty much says, no, that's bullshit. Um, security is never going to make the company money. Um, the, the keynote actually broke that a little bit. Unless you're selling security services, security is never going to make the company money. But you have, so if you're working in manufacturing, secure, compare security to HSE, to health and safety. If you're working in you know, software company, compare it to QA. This is like a asset protection. You know, they already have some framework. They're already spending money somewhere to make sure that they don't lose their assets. Um, you know, security guards, things like that. Equate it to that. You know, there's, there, you know, no one's sitting there saying, I'm not going to spend any money on the HSE. I don't care if people lose their hands. Like, no one's doing that. Make it correlated to that. Speak in their, in their language. Understand the industry that you're in. Like I said, it's software QA because you know you don't want to introduce huge bugs and bring things down. If it's you know health and safety, cool, whatever that makes sense. You can um, pitch security. The, the way to pitch security is a bit of a a bit of a profit center. It is the shifting left. I hate buzzwords, but the idea of so it's why I'm going to talk about the ISO stuff again. Um, one of the reasons I like ISO. And even if you don't need it, or getting more or less getting security certs at the business level that you may not need before you need them, so you can say, "Hey, I know no one asked, but by the way, we have our SOC two, and we have this, and we have we have ISO. We're doing these things, and you know, getting a security training your salespeople on security, so they talk about it right away. That can be the differentiator on the sales. Um, but again, tailoring it to your business. So it's again, it's like a profit assistance center, not a profit center, but do as much as possible to make it seem to the business like it's not just some costs. Um, but again, there is a great talk from Outward Jake out there that can go into that in a lot more detail than I can. Um, he, and uh, one of the other big takeaways from that is be prepared if you get caught in an elevator or a hallway with someone from the board to have your 30 second security pitch. If someone says, so what do you do in security? You go, oh, we secure people. It's like, no, no, no. Cool, you're going to lose 20% of your budget overnight by saying something like that. Have an answer to that. What is your mission statement? How do you protect the business? What are you doing? Um, you know, as soon as possible, you need to talk costs and resource issues because chances are you came in and there is the budget's already fine for the year, so see if you can sneak a little bit of budget in here or there, because you've probably identified a few things that need to be uh, replaced immediately. I think I have a slide, I have a few slides talk about that. Um, so, phase two, analysis and documentation. I've talked about doing some of it, but this is where all the resources and the information you've gathered from phase one, you start documenting it. Um, policies could probably go in here too, but vulnerabilities. Um, this somewhat of an easy win, I don't like to say easy win, but um, now that you've understood what's out there, understand what vulnerabilities you have, you may not have a vulnerability scanner, so you show down um, to scan your external vulnerabilities. Um, you may just have to do it manually, but it's also like 60 bucks a month to pay for, or maybe even less, I don't know what it is anymore. It's like 60 bucks a month to pay for the automated stuff. You can probably sneak that in on an expense report and call it a meal. Don't, don't buy on your expense report, but do if you need to. Um, so, if the employer is watching, I've never done that. Um, so, assessment, um, I'd like to introduce, um, before you just start blanket patching, my patching is great, but this is all about metrics and optics, so like, let's implement a vulnerability scanner beforehand so we can say, hey, here are all, all of our vulnerabilities in one month of maintenance, windows and patching, we closed all of these. Yeah, especially, you know, it, you know, you, it's up to you if you consider the, the low ones just so that you can show bigger numbers, you know, this is all optics. So, um, open VAS if you're trying to do internal, um, the reporting is not great. Um, there is some reporting that introduced, if you use Vuln Whisperer and Elk, it's kind of out of date, but I think you can still get it to integrate. Um, 
use, use open source if you have to. If you can't, you use the big names. You can, I'm going to talk open source because I'm assuming you have no budget, but if, if you, you can Google big phone scanners or you can talk to someone in the hallway, I'm sure they'll sell you something. If you have budget, um, talk about generating differential reports, that's huge. They want to see, see that you're actually doing something. Talk about Shodan. Um, and, and you know, prioritize these things. Go from the, you know, go, go from high or even the riskiest things. Don't always just go high because, you know, stuff like, like I was talking about with um, Spectre and Meltdown, those are high, but talk about probability of it actually happening. Um, as soon as you can, patching. Um, do it manually if you have to. Do it with WSUS. Um, this may be a really good time to bring in an MSSP because patching sucks and every MSP, MSSP or MSP managed service provider or managed security service provider. I'm going to define things. Um, I don't know if you, you have the time. If you can wrangle in IT to do the patching for you, cool. Um, don't just think WSUS is free and it's Windows product. It's, it's not free, it, it doesn't work unless you have like someone really working on it, so it's very high maintenance unless you have experience with it, or if you just rebuild it every month, then that works very well if you have the staff to do that. I, I, yeah. But WSS just breaks randomly. Um, cool. We, we all know about patching, but don't make patching sound simple. And then also, so like I said, I'm talking manufacturing companies, but at this point, like if you're in application company, do not just say, cool, we're going to open up a bug bounty. Don't do this right now. Um, same thing, and don't do a pen test right now. Because the thing is, like, my seven-year-old son could probably find out how to hack into you at this point. Um, do, do not spend a bunch of money on pen test unless the board's really asking. Same thing with bug. You don't have the staff at this point to handle a bug bounty or handle the findings from a pen test. Don't, don't do it. You, Close some of the gaps before you waste that money. Um, and I guarantee you, board and all that, that people are going to be asking, hey, why didn't you do a pen test yet? Because it's a waste, the pen test red team is a waste of time at this point. It's, I, I, you know, a, a defensive person can tell you where the gaps are. Wait till you've closed enough of the gaps and have enough of the staff to deal with the findings. So, um, sorry if there's any pen test firms out here. I'm not trying to steal money from you. But, um, instant response prep. This is something that um, we have come up with a unique way of doing it here. It shouldn't be unique. The reality is I think IT should be very integrated with security. Um, and there should not be these silos. But um, we have no incident response staff. What we have is anyone in IT management can be an incident manager. And you have, you know, people who are subject matter experts on email or IAM or network or platform, wherever the, the breach is, they, there's a skills matrix and they get called in for incidents. That is a cool way to do it. It's a cool way to upskill people. It's a cool way to, you know, limit resource use um, and, and budget. But if you need to, if you, you think you're getting breached enough that you need a managed detection and response team, cool. Um, you can also, you know, have a retainer with FireEye, maybe, and Dragos, whoever you're, um, you know, whatever industry you're in. So, um, but yeah, so we have, our CERT team is very screened and distributed, but um, that is a cool model. Make sure you have policies, procedures, playbooks, work instructions. There are a lot out there. The Scottish government has some really cool ones, actually. Um, CISA has some good ones. Um, you're, if, if you are in you know, certain industries, there's a CERT or an ISAC that will probably give you a specific one for your industry, oil and gas, all that. There's a bunch of ones, especially for government. There's probably specific tailored ones for you. But um, also understand breach reporting. Um, talk to legal about this and compliance um, requirements, you know, privacy breaches and all that. There's you know, CCPA and GDPR, but then um, you know, there's with CMMC, which is in the military, you know, supply chain space, it's like 72 hours after a detected breach, you have to talk to the FBI. To find who talks to the FBI, I don't want to talk to the FBI. If you need something special that um, to report, like with CMMC and DFARS and all that, you need to have a certificate so that you can upload it to the portal. Make sure you have that well in advance, test these things. Um, you don't have to bring in a firm to test these. You can do tabletop pretty easily, you know, you know, find it, 
you, you can find TTP's um, tactics, um, techniques, and um, peace. Sorry, brain fart. Um, and you, but you can find, you know, you can run through attack, um, minor attack, run through all of these things. Do that before you pay a company, you know. Make sure you have even the basics, you know, and you know who your team is and all of that. Have these things defined, have people's phone numbers so you can call them, have you know their time zones, don't, you know, count on people being available at certain times. We're a global team, so we have one for each region, and if we don't have someone in a region, then people have to kind of Okay, cool. I do agree to get called at midnight and, you know, have those things. Have toil time, which is take time off in lieu of. Have those things set up. If you're borrowing people from their normal job, please give the chance to, if your incident responder has worked like three weeks straight without, um, without sleep, give them some amount of time off in compensation. Don't just pay them in pizza. That's not enough. Um, change management. Not necessarily your job, but um, it will be if it doesn't happen. So um, make sure that the organization is implementing change management with peer review, please. Not just someone recommended to change, they talked to some manager and this got approved, like require peer review. And not just peer review that says, I agree, like that's not enough. Have a real peer review system. There have been times, you know, that I have seen an alert come in at midnight and gone and investigated and we have a new global admin there was change requests that I wasn't a uh, global admin on Office 365. There was change that I wasn't aware of to add a consultant in for that reason. Also, probably don't be a global admin if you don't need to. I'll talk about principle of least privilege in a second. But yeah, um, change management, you need to do it. And peer review is great because there, there are security risks that you not be, may not be aware of. Um, even track changes that you don't think require approvals, this would be called a normal change. Established procedures for normal changes, things like database, da database failover, and little things that may happen all the time, but track them if you can. If you just track these tickets, cool, but track every change that you can feasibly do. Um, if you don't have your help desk, you may have a system for it. If you don't, use a Google form, use Excel, use the, use the internet or SharePoint if you have that kind of stuff. Don't, don't, you can buy something right away if you aren't using it, but like, Excel is, you know, good enough for almost everything we need to do here. Um, phase three, mitigation and remediation. Again, you may discover something right away with the vulnerability that you need to patch day one, because you discovered that something hadn't been patched in some amount of years, some system that didn't exist, or that no one knew existed, um, but um, this is when I really think you should start remediation, but you may find some obvious ones. Um, discovery for least privilege. Um, you can use PowerShell to discover all sorts of things if you're in Windows environments, but there are other things. Talk to people. We, uh, I worked with an organization years and years ago where um, the domain administrator password was like common knowledge, but we couldn't change it because it was common knowledge. So literally, set up right in front of the building and every person that walked in you kind of just asked, hey, um, I forgot the admin password, can you give it to me? Kind of wrote down everyone's name, figured out how many people, and then started working with those people. That is, hopefully you don't have to do that, um, but yeah. Um, I also worked in a, a, a place when I was doing merger and acquisition where they had um, domain users and domain admins. Don't do that, fix that right away. The reason for that one was that what if someone needs to remote desktop over the VPN to their computer? Okay, there's a lot easier ways to do that. Even just remote desktop users, but there are ways to do that through privilege delegation. Just look up Active Directory delegation. Don't, don't do that. Um, so, talk to people about those things. Um, there's PowerShell scripts for discovery. There's Bloodhound and Pink Castle, which will tell you a lot of these things. Um, too much information. And do not blindly implement everything that Pink Castle recommends, like right away. You will break things if you let one, two, three things at a time. Do it slowly so you know what broke what. You will break things, um, definitely speaking from experience. Um, you have a lot of local admin, you won't know why. Uh, if you have engineering or software development staff, they need it because SolidWorks or something um, requires it and something breaks. You can use Procmon, um, Sys Internals tool on Windows to see what process that's failing on and it is great. Um, reduction of privileged AD accounts, uh, you're going to have like nine, at least in my experience, you're going to have like nine disabled accounts for whatever reason in still in domain admins. Remove those immediately. They don't need to be there, that's an easy way. Um, report on these metrics, report on 
every metric that you can through this. Um, I can also, I have given an eight hour talk on just active directory security, and I talked for like two hours on least privilege, so I um, talked for a long time about this. Easy wins. I don't like using the word easy, but, um, yeah. That go, I don't know. Okay. So, um, firewall rule closures, figure out, you're going to have all sorts of stupid rules. Do those right away, figure out how to move, you know, things from port 3389 to using VPN or something like Zscaler if you're using it. Um, session lockout, chances are people can stay logged in forever. Implement a session lockout, these are pretty easy. Pre-log on advisory, your legal team will love you, but you won't care too much. These are easy things that you can do without too much anger. Do not implement five minute session logouts every, or honestly even 15 minutes can really piss people off sometimes because every time I sneeze my computer locks out, you know, figure it out and maybe move it down slowly. If people are used to leaving their computer open for hours and hours at a time, do it slowly. Account auditing, um, you're going to have hundreds of accounts that don't, um, that haven't been logged into in forever. There's a lot of ways to detect that, to that. Work with HR to figure out what you can remove. Um, have some sort of um, permission review quarterly, work on that. Change service account and admin passwords. That's not an easy win. That's very difficult for service accounts, but do it. Use managed service accounts, group managed service accounts in Windows. Do it. That's a huge win. A service account is domain admin and has been you, hopefully at this point, it's not domain admin anymore. You can, um, Sean Metcalf has a really good blog on how to um, reduce service account permissions, but like change the password, please. They, they haven't changed in a very long time. In some cases, almost a lot of them have been live, so that's not fun. Um, yes. Replacement and renewals. Um, good chance to increase security with easy wins. Um, I'm going to talk renewals, but also actually using the tools that you have. So, um, antivirus, EDR, I know that we hate it, we say it doesn't actually stop things, but like, if you talk to any incident responder, if you would actually end and looked at the antivirus logs, you probably would have caught a, the attack like months ago, but you ignore it. So like, yeah, um, if you're using some weird legacy antivirus, try and upsell to EDR, it's usually not that much more money. If you're, in some cases you're paying for EDR, you're not using it, um, like, use it. Do that before you pay for some extra tool, you know, before you get some theme. If you're not actually looking at your EDR logs, you're not looking at these things, you're not actually them, then, um, yeah, don't pay for something until you're using what you have. Um, network refresh, you, you know, I've worked at places that have 20 year old ASAs. Um, this is in the Cisco ASA firewalls. Um, it's a really easy win sometimes because even if it's a lot more money to put in, you know, Fortinet or Palo Alto or whichever, you, you get places that are paying for like 50 meg and they're getting like half a meg because their ASA has been failing for the last 10 years. Um, so, sell them on faster internet. Um, and, and that's an easy one um, sometimes. Uh, you may have really old consumer grade wireless access points. I've seen this way too many times. Replace those with ones with radius and people will love you again because you'll speed up their wireless. Um, so, yeah, that app pretty much changed now because it means something different than it did two years ago. So, oops. Um, Okay, yeah, network refresh, switches, all of that, you know, figure out maybe you're using an MPLS and you can save money going to SD-WAN. Figure that out. Um, mainly do these if you can save money. Um, at this point, I still don't agree with spending money. Um, I like the uh, antivirus and EDR a lot because you can do um, what, what a salesperson at Silence called it is poor man's app whitelisting. You may not have the resources to implement app blocker, but you can do a lot of those things with EDR tools in kind of a roundabout way. Uh, you can also get removable media control out of most of these, which is great. So you don't, you know, so that you can whitelist those things and, act, and just block by default um, unknown removable media. How am I doing on that? Oh, cool. Oh, I didn't get the last one, Laps. This goes into the, um, it's local admin password solution. There actually was a talk a few years ago at Practice Con on, it's called something clever like running laps around laps. There's a PowerShell way to do this better, but change your local admin password to Laps is a way to do it automatically. Do not, if you're using, um, group, if you have passwords in group policy and you're setting it that way, don't do it. Um, Laps is great, it's fairly easy to, not easy to roll out, but you know, if you baselined and excluded your SQL 
servers and a few other things like that at first, then you can do it fairly quickly. Um, okay, I've been talking fast. I got here quicker than I thought, so I may ramble about some other things too. Phase four, looking forward, this is budgetary planning, all of that. It's lessons learned and moving it into the next year. This is really where you should probably get your roadmap. This is really where you're going to start potentially buying tools if you have budget. Um, really start doing maybe some of the fun stuff or at least planning for it. Um, again, I'm big on metrics and measuring progress because, um, again, so much of this is convincing people why security matters and that you're actually doing things and moving the needle. Um, distribute a survey and see how people are happy with you, how they're not happy, you know, give them a chance to complain. Um, so it will measure user pain and perceived improvements to have, hopefully you listen to me at the beginning and distribute a survey. Um, allow suggestions, some of them you can discard because they're long rants about how I should be allowed access to everything because you should trust me because I'm some great engineer. And take it with a grain of salt. Um, and then, you know, even do self-assessment with your team and, you know, figure out where you're at. Um, any differential reports, do another gap analysis at some point. You, I must have gotten rid of that slide at some point, but gap analysis is essentially, um, some people actually don't know this term. I thought it was pretty universal, but um, do, do a gap analysis at, at the beginning and essentially say, here's where we want to be and here's where we are, what steps and what order we need to do to get there. So do another gap analysis to say, cool, are we actually as far as we thought we are? Do more vulnerability scans, measure your progress, um, compare your survey, I just talked about that. Um, you know, but really, anything you've done, document it in detail, bullet it in slides, make sure everybody of substance at your company knows all the things you've improved. Um, another thing I really like to do um, that now, uh, I have a little bit of time to talk to you, is I, I, I really like to not just implement a security tool and um, essentially piss off or slow people down. Think of, like I was talking about with the firewall, think of ways that your security tool can make people's lives easier. Uh, Swift on security um, talks, says something to the extent of that um, security is, is extreme operational uh, excellence. It's how can we, uh, ideally, security is the way that we push to get new software, new hardware that will run much better um, for people. You know, upgrading Windows 10 or 11 should improve people's lives. Side note, I love that Windows 11 is requiring um, TPM. I know a lot of people hate it, but it is a ballsy move for Windows to obsolete old hardware because their biggest problem is legacy systems and interoperability and um, yeah, so that is great. Um, but moving to those things just moves the needle so much, but it also emphasize to people, hey, this makes your life easier. I haven't talked much about a seam. I actually got rid of that because I can give a long talk about building from elastic. So um, let's talk. I think I have this budget preparation. Um, so set priorities for findings in the last slide. You know, whatever you found, whatever you need for the next year, whatever people's pain points are, um, pay attention to it. Um, Reevaluate your threat model. Maybe it's changed. Maybe the industry's changed in a year. Reevaluate. Think about an MSSB for a SOC. Um, so something that I've done is um, Elasticsearch is great. Two years ago it was actually not even as great, but I still loved it back then. Um, now it's actually they sell a scene, so it's it's free. They even have a free EDR. I've not tested it. Can't speak to that. But they bought Endgame, which was good back then, and I trust. Well, that's not great things, but some cool idea that you could use is essentially um, find out where your old hardware is. There's probably enough of it. Build it uh, JBOD, just a bunch of disks. Um, there's bad jokes in there too. But um, you so so build that out. And build CentOS or now ideally like Rocky Linux, one of those things. And Elastic. And at first you can make it a data lake. Send all of your stuff there. Send all of your logs. Use it just for um, you can use it just for compliance and reporting at the end. But also there's so much basic rules in there, and it's free. Um, and, you know, they encourage you to buy some licenses, and it's probably good because you'll need some support if it's just you. But a lot you, with old hardware and minimal time and money, you can you you can do a lot with Elastic. It'll be your seam. You we we. Even had some luck in getting the level one help desk to um, essentially be the 
level one SOC, you know, they know their users, so if you give them like a Azure risky sign-in, um, they can call that user up right away and say, hey, are you actually in Sweden? Are you actually in Tunisia? Um, all those things. And I, actually, I really like those things to come from help desk, come from someone trusted. I don't want to train users to just give security information to random people they've never emailed before. So really try and build that chain of trust um, because, I mean, those are our phishing contexts and our social engineering contexts, right? Is, hey, you know, bring, um, you, there's a security alert, put your information in here. Don't train your users to, to give strangers information. If you don't know the user, try and get a trusted person to email them. Um, so that actually works really well. Um, but you, you can, you know, people love that kind of upskill. And um, so if you can farm out some of your low level SOC stuff, if you don't actually have a SOC to IT and help desk, sometimes they love it. And then also sell them on, hey, um, email guys or active directory guys, by the way, here's a bucket of logs. If you want to check anything, you know, we're checking for security, but you may want to check for error logs. Sell them on, hey, while you're installing this agent, I just want to tell you all the cool things you can get out of here. You know, network guys may find failures earlier because um, they can look their love. So don't don't silo this. Don't make tools only usable for you. If if you can farm it out to other people, um, do everything you can to make people's lives easier, not harder. Don't be a time suck. Try and be a value add. Um, but you may just at this point say, hey, this SOC stuff, the security operations stuff is hard. Let's go to an MSSP. Um, find a good one. There, honestly, it, if, if you're small, go to a boutique one that deals with your industry and is local. I love, I've, I've worked at boutique MSBs, small MSBs and MSSBs my entire career. They can be great. They can also suck, but you can usually find out reputation pretty quickly, especially at something like these sites. You know, talk to people here, hey, is that company any good? No, they suck. Okay, ignore them. Um, start working on MFA. Hopefully, you've turned some of it on by this point. Um, if you're using Active Directory, Authlight connection would be great. Authlight is a, it is a very cheap, um, small MFA solution. Um, it's wonderful if you're using on-premise stuff. Um, look at it, 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 and I mean cheap, like perpetual licenses for like $90 a user. It's, they have to lose money. Um, network overhaul, I talked about that. Chances are, at least in manufacturing, where I've always worked, is Chances are you have a flat network with layer two switches, dumb switches. Yeah. Do your suggestions for renewal replacement, just talk about that. Um, hardening, um, look at your industry. There may be hardening guidelines. I've always worked in the military supply chain, um, mill adjacent stuff, so I use DOD sticks. Start from high, move your way down. Don't do it. Again, this is a place with hardening baselines. Do not just say, cool, here, here's every single setting. Just don't go like Microsoft or someone's best practices, because Microsoft has like 1,200 settings at least in just their Windows 10 baselines. Don't, don't just turn those on overnight. You, yeah, it'd be horrible. Turn, go at high, like DOD, STIGS, high, or CIS. Go, you know, high and down, implement those, maybe even one setting at a time slowly, and have pilot groups. Um, principle of least functionality comes into that. Turn off things you don't need. Separate out server resources. Talk about seam. Um, Acronym I kind of made up because there's network based or hardware oh, or network or host intrusion detection or prevention systems. Use, don't pay for it. Use Snort, Suricata, one of those two, whichever makes sense. Chance or one of your vendors will sell you um, enrichment rules for them. And then use uh, Bro as well because it's not really an idea. But people call it that. It's behavior analytics for your. Um, it's, you know, anomaly detection for your network. So, um, maybe VCAP if you have the resource for it. Uh, oh, I said bro, I meant Zeke, sorry. Um, and then, hard time updating that in my head. And then, um, Moloch is really cool for VCAP. Um, don't keep those very long because you'll fill up your hardware very quickly. Um, cool. At this point, hopefully you've talked to management more than two times, but if you haven't, um, present your budget. Re review the whole InfoSec as an asset protection center or ways that you can embed left into sales. Um, present your compliance improvement goals, not just compliance to you know, NIST or whichever you're trying to comply with, but also to your internal policies. Present your differential reports and explain some advanced concepts. Um, chances are they've been asking you questions like pen tests or different things. Um, 
tell them why no, don't just give a quick no, tell them, explain to them, hey, I have a plan, this is on my roadmap, but here's why I don't want a bug bounty tomorrow, because I'm going to overwhelm our team, and there will be a bunch of bugs out there that people now know about, because it's fun to disclose. So, um, TLDR, not everyone knows what that means, you guys spend less time on the internet than me, for whatever reason, a lot of people didn't know TLDR is too long to get to read. Um, so, this is everything I've covered. Um, do things based on priorities. Don't just make shit up in your head. Um, threat model all the things. Um, you know, again, don't make it up in your head. Discover things. Know what's out there. Asset management. Educate all the users. Not really. I actually recommend educating your um, high-risk users. Something I didn't talk about that I promised to get back to is that is um, phishing simulation. I hate it. You can do it if you need to, but I hate it because it just breaks your trust with users. If you have something like Proofpoint, it'll tell you who are your risky clickers, who are your very attack people, target them. You can see reports in almost every email gateway, who's clicking the links. Go to them first, don't break users' trust. Figure out, you know, Proofpoint will say, hey, we sent this email to this person because we didn't think it was risky, then they clicked it after we realized it was risky or before, blah, blah, blah. And so you should probably talk to this person because they've done that like 36 times this month, and that's real things that happen. Um, so, yeah, to try not to do anything to break trust with your users, don't lie to them. I, I just, I, there, there are ways to do phishing training well. Also, don't just turn on uh, no before with every rule. I've heard horror stories. There's one in there that's like, talk to HR because you, you've, got a, you, you've been accused of sexual harassment. That's a really good way to never be able to do phishing simulation again and know, yeah, it, it went to like a head of sales or something um, and they went and yelled and said, why are you accusing me of this? I've never, blah, blah, blah. And then, which if someone's that defensive, it probably means they did, but that's aside from this. Um, that's probably a good red, red herring there. Um, but don't, don't do things that break users' trust, just don't. Probably need to make that a whole slide because we like to be manipulated and the sleazy don't do it. Um, back up all the things. Um, do it, disaster recovery, business continuity, figure out your RTOs, RPOs. If you don't know, know all those, hopefully you have a backup team. Um, I like to open source all the things. I think they're great and I don't always trust vendors. Um, and a lot of times with open source, it's easier to take your data somewhere else because there's more interoperability. Uh, if you have budget, maybe don't. And then buy all the things eventually. Probably, hopefully you've listened to me and you have not bought anything this year. Okay, um, resources. Um, if you're taking pictures, some of this is outdated. I'll give it a second to take a picture. This is, an older version of this is on my website, which again is in two slides, um, but talks through a bunch of the resources that I mentioned. Um, cool, resources continued. Um, lots of cool things. Um, again, slides online. Implement these free-ish things before you pay money. Um, and then my website, homebrewsec.com forward slash talks. Um, there's one in, one of these online. Uh, once I figure out how to get into GitHub, I will publish today's talks. Um, there's a the hashtag at the bottom. I'll check it if you. I guess I didn't intro that at the beginning, but if you have any thoughts on this talk or you've been live tweeting, I hope you tagged it with infosec in 365. And then um, you can mean tweet me or subtweet me uh, at, on Twitter. And the conference plug, um, I'm sure you'll probably introduce this, but you know, give feedback. If I didn't explain things and I sucked, let me know. I'd like to improve this site. Giving this talk a bunch of times, and every time I make changes, so tell me how to make changes, and then conference anything.